Amitaku with me. I'm Petu Kilech, I'm Tema Wastin, I'm Heng Chuzak Tilo. I'd like to give you that traditional greeting in one of the classical languages of this hemisphere, known as Lakota. And what I said was, hello, my relatives. Today's a good day. My heart is strong and I extend my hand in friendship. I've known uh, Larry, as he said, for a number of years. And as I began my presentation, I also like to remember a very important member of this community who I worked with for many years. Her name was Jan Hamill. I think she was a graduate of Ball State, if I'm not uh, mistaken. But she took on this issue of reburial, repatriation of human remains. The idea that our ancestors, the artifacts of our people, should be returned to their rightful owners. And especially in the area of human remains that they shouldn't be displayed in open exhibitions in various universities and museums. They should be returned to the Mother Earth. And we always used the analogy, and a matter of fact, in the early days of the American Indian Movement, we in fact used this analogy in practice, where when we found various human remains on display, we threatened various institutions, state government, universities, to go to the local cemeteries with shovels and start digging up the remains of the non-Indian community to see what their reaction would be. And of course, this forced the issue, but it was people like Jan Hamill who were able to bridge that link between the universities, the museums, to the Indian community. She traveled far and wide throughout this area, throughout America, and it was probably one of the key people in passing federal legislation that now protects and calls for repatriation and the protection of Indian graves and that whole issue. And also a couple other people that I have to mention who are cornerstones of our movement, and that is many of you probably know them or heard of them, one being Floyd Red Crow Westerman, a noted actor, singer, activist, and also Mr. Vernon Wapan and Nini Belcourt, who for many years uh, was a leader of the American Indian Movement and especially well known in the issue of Indian mascots. The idea that we are Indian people, we're not mascots for America's fun and games. And that if we can't be respected as human people, as human beings with human rights, how can we move on to the more she would say substantial issues of treaty rights, racism, discrimination, if we're not even looked on as human beings, if we're looked on as mascots, stereotype images. So it's important movements that all these people, and Floyd being the great musician he was, to use music to create understanding. People have always said that music is the the international language of understanding. And Floyd, he traveled the world trying to bring about understanding for Indian people and indeed indigenous issues. Again, I'd also like to thank the museum who has done these things and displays here in a very respectful manner. They have established the Idle Shore Fellowship, which actually brings together Indian artists. And this is the idea behind a lot of the work that Jan and a lot of us did through the years, was to allow you as non-Indian and Indian communities, wherever you are, to experience the culture, the history of our people, and not be trapped by stereotype images 
about the idea that Columbus discovered America. We discovered Columbus. <laughs> he was lost, sick, wrapped in rags, and he washed up on our shores. And uh, a lot of times, those images are portrayed as a true history of America, when in fact, our indigenous people have a living history and culture that exists today. And here I think is a very appropriate place, a town that's called Indianapolis. <laughs> that Indian people have their rightful place in this community. And remember, as Mr. Zimmerman has said, Larry, he first thanked the people here from the community. Many of you probably never had a chance to even learn about them in the public schools of Indiana. American Indian people have been edited out of existence in the public school systems of America. It's only through the work in the last 25, 30 years that this has begun to change. And it's because of activities like this. It's because of those profession, professional people, Indian and non-Indian, who you'll meet on this panel, who have struggled their whole professional career to bring understanding, to get a different viewpoint than the traditional stereotype racist images portrayed about Indian people that were always somehow about the romantic history instead of being alive and well in today's society and having contributed to the well-being of America. Just by fact alone, we contributed the land. <laughs> Let's start there. And then you get into the various treaties. And that's what brought us to Wounded Knee, was that tragic history where we were out of sight, out of mind. But remember, the various books that you read don't tell the true history of the modern day Wounded Knee, let alone the past. We were invited as the American Indian Movement by what was known at that time as the Oglala Sioux Civil Rights Organization, headed by two very distinguished, respected gentlemen, a man by the name of Vern Long and another young man by the name of Pedro Bisnet. They had struggled mightily. They had struggled to bring about justice with the tribal government. We all try to make our governments accountable, be it county, be it city, and that's what these gentlemen were doing, trying to make the government accountable. But they were met by violence, intimidation. And so they asked the one organization that stood up for Indian people at any cost, that was American Indian Movement, founded in 1968 in the city of Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're always portrayed as urban outside agitators. In fact, the overwhelming majority of people inside Wounded Knee in 1973 were Oglala citizens of our nation, of our tribe, of our reservation. And they were either members of Oglala Sioux Civil Rights Organization or members of local AIM chapters. And so AIM was an organization that, yes, started in the urban areas but soon spread, especially throughout the West to reservation communities where the conditions existed at the time and they still exist today. Diseases that had been wiped out from the rest of American society still existed there and exist today like tuberculosis. Where 65% of our people on our reservation are infected with diabetes. Where the average grade level at the time was about eight grades. Where the dropout rate in high school was 80, 90% from the freshman class to the senior class. These are conditions, many of which still exist today at reservation communities. Many of you heard about casinos. There are many, there, first of all, there are about 2.3 million Indian people in America in the last census. 
550 federally recognized tribes. Out of that, maybe half are engaged in some form of gaming. The gaming tribes that actually make a large, sizable profit are few because of the social needs that I just mentioned. Those dollars don't go very far in rural communities. You have to have population in order to have successful businesses, especially casino tourist industry. 